Good time of the day. This is The Wide World of Distributions, a BirdCore Special Topics Talk, number seven. I'm Dr. Mark Williamson for Biostats Core at UND. The purpose of this talk, the goal as it were, is to learn about statistical distributions. For many of you, if you've taken introductory stats, maybe the only thing you remember about that outside of, say, a normal distribution is something like a t-distribution. Turns out there are many more distributions out there in this wide world of distributions we'll be dipping our toes into, which can help us have better statistical understanding, better statistical modding, modeling, and ultimately better statistical insights. I hope at the end of this talk, you have a greater appreciation and ability to work with statistical distributions. Before moving on, it would be helpful for you to take the pretest, find the link here or in the description below. All right, let's take a stab at a definition here. One definition that I found is a statistical distribution is a function that shows the possible values for a variable and how often they occur. So you can think of it this way. A big part of statistics is trying to estimate the likelihood of a certain event or how likely a certain variable is to fall within a certain value. You can go all the way from essentially zero probability or impossible already to certain probability or absolutely likely and anywhere in between. Therefore, a statistical distribution as a function would kind of help tell you that depending on the value, how likely it is. So looking at some of the, the properties of what this function would look like is one, the probability that X can take on a specific value is PX or probability X. So that's what, what goes on there and PX property of this is is non negative for all real x so you can't have negative probability zero is the bottom line and then finally it's kind of important the sum of these probabilities of all x equals one so the idea here is that a series distribution it's a function shown by the line here all the possible values so at like 10 11 that is the highest probability and it tapers out of each side but if you sum across it, so um, this is some of your calculus coming to play here, it sums up to one. And so this captures everything about the probability through this range. So turning now, like looking to the variables perspective. Now variables will be sampled from random distributions that occur naturally. So variables, like whether you're measuring height or pedal number or dice rolls, whatever, they come from a random distribution. Now each distribution tells a different story about the process to produce these variables. Uh, dice rolls, coin flips, maybe different generation processes than the number of hairs on someone's head, etc. And then each distribution has a mean variance and probability density function. So mean average value varies how much spread it has and then probability density function is essentially the, uh, the function that tells you at a certain value of X, what's the probability of it. And so here is another example going from a little more abstract to an actual uh, sampling distribution. So we had 10 coin flips. So a generation process of a variable and we see that the most likely number of heads is five on because you know coins are 50 50 and we can see that at the outliers like either one head or one tails are very unlikely okay so with all that in mind there are a couple more ways we could define this uh, similar wording but gives gives a little more nuance so the first is a mathematical construct to describe how variables are generated so we're using mathematics and and it helps understand where how data comes to be now a third way which is i would say 
the most memorable way for me is actually how I learned it in my this course is a mathematical description of how data conceivably can be produced. So all three of these function, construct description, are different ways of trying to define and explain what a statistical distribution is. Next, let's turn our gaze and attention towards the origin of variables. So again, because statistical distributions help us understand and predict the probabilities of certain values of variables, we want to look at how these variables may come to be. So at the heart of it is random generation processes. That is, um, yeah, what how data comes to be. So we're going to talk about three main ones. First of all is Gaussian. This is random dispersal for a central point, or another way to explain it is random diffusion from a mean. This is your classical normal distribution. In fact, a great physical example is, to say, a Plinko machine. Uh, so it's like this random dispersion from a central point, and you get this classical symmetrical histogram shape. Now, two other generation processes are A, the Bernoulli trial, which is a discrete event with only two outcomes, so success and failure, with a constant probability of success. Best Example of this is a coin flip. So heads or tails, success or failure. And if it's a fair coin, the probability of success is 50% for each of those outcomes. And then the other random generation process, B, is a Poisson point process, where events occur individually in continuous time or space. So it's sort of like a, a rate. So where this is discrete um, and only in binary, this is discrete but it has more of what we would call a count variable. So Poisson point processes you could also call counts. So with that being said, let's look at some broad classification of distributions. Discrete, which only takes on integer or count variables. So again, those are those sort of Poisson processes um, in some ways, as well as it can be binary, things like that, where you only have integers, so you can have one, two, three, four, zero, whatever, but you can't have fractions. Whereas continuous takes on any numerical value within range. So if you have enough counts, it, it, it's, it smooths out, and you can have any sort of um, fine tuning. So you could have one, 1.1, 1 1.11, etc. And so the continuous and discrete are kind of two broad classes from there. Okay, next let's scour your eyes a little bit with this table of properties of some of the distributions we'll look at more detail today. So the green are continuous and the orange are discrete. So starting with the normal distribution, this is what most people are familiar with and indeed most classical tests assume normality. One of the big reasons why learning other distributions are really helpful is, turns out you can run other statistical tests that don't have the assumption of normality. It really broadens the ability to run tests given how some of your data might be generated. So we're not gonna look too much notation, just kind of gives us what you might write and say a method section, but also gives sort of the parameters. So the range here is gonna be important, mean, variance, and then explanation. So the normal distribution is interesting because it has a unbounded or infinite range. It can theoretically go from negative to infinity to infinity, though in practice, most variables don't actually do that. Then the mean and then variance. So pretty straightforward. Now what's interesting about the normal distribution is actually its mean is independent of the variance. They don't have a relationship, which is not true of any of the other distributions other than the log normal, which is essentially just a transformation of the normal you see here that uh, main difference is this is a little more complicated to calculate this but then the range is restricted to above one or above zero and again normal is dispersion through a central point and then the log normal is really just uh, the log transformation you can accomplish this through just log transforming your data beforehand and have the same sort of outcome now on to exponential and gamma these both have a ranges are greater than zero 
And you see here in the exponential, it has its mean is this beta, and then its variance is beta squared. So you see how that there's a relationship unlike the normal. And this can be explained as time between events that occur at a certain rate. So exponential is time between events. Gamma has this kappa and theta, and it is the time it takes for k events to occur within a rate, or the sum of k exponential events. And again, the variance you can see is essentially the squared of the mean. So these have mean and variance relate to each other. Now, beta is a little different. This is actually bounded between 0 and 1. It actually can't be 0 or 1. And it's a divided by a plus b. So this is essentially a percentage or proportion, however you want to call it. And it's a distribution probably based on a successes and b failures. So beta is very commonly like percent data, percentage data, or proportion data, however you want to call it. Now moving on to our discrete, we have binomial, which we can see now the range here is 0, 1, 2. We can see it's integer values. Its mean is n times p, and then variance is n times p, and then 1 minus p. So x is the number of positive events out of n trials with the probability of success p. So binomial, essentially a bunch of those Bernoulli trial events together. Uh, geometric, similar, but now we can see that the range is a little bit different. You can go one, two, three. And actually, it turns out uh, geometric can be conceived in another way, and that can start at zero, but for our purposes, we'll just do this version. And this is the number of trials with the probability of success that are needed to obtain one success. So say you're flipping coins, how many you need to flip until you get at least one heads. Um, negative binomial is the number of failures before a certain amount of successes. Uh, it can also be thought of in a different way, and we'll look more into detail of that later. It can go from 0, 1, 2, et cetera, integers. Again, just like all these other ones, the, their means are related to their variances, or maybe more probably their variances are if some sort of function of their mean. And Poisson is a count of items in a standard unit of effort that occur at a rate uh, theta. So Poisson is because of the classic count variable type of distribution. Okay, now that I've enamored you with that stunning distribution properties, we'll move on here. Uh, one quick thing to note here is there's also, each of those also have a specific probability density function. I didn't go into that here and I won't really go into all the math, but I do have re references that can go much more into that if you're interested. We're gonna kind of keep keep more of the skimming level. So statistical tests, kind of the meat of why we would want maybe these distributions. So what sort of tests use such distributions? Well, as I kind of mentioned before, parametric tests assume a normal or Gaussian distribution. So your ANOVA, your t-test, your linear regression, et cetera, all typically take a normal distribution. However, something like a generalized linear model can use various distributions. And you might be familiar with these sort of tests already. So now generalized refers to models that don't assume a normal distribution. The most common ones are like the Poisson regression or logistic regression, which aren't normally distributed, either Poisson or binary binomial. But you can use a generalized linear mixed model with any of the distributions or that we talked about and beyond. So for example, what I have here is a scatter plot and we can see this data actually has three different fit. We have a normal fit, that kind of classical straight line, and a Poisson and gamma. You can see they're actually curved. They fit the data a little bit differently. But you can, uh, the take home point with this graph here is you can run the same data with different distributions and some might be better or worse for it. Okay, with that, let's talk a little bit more how to plot results because you can see how with the Poisson and gamma, they're not linear, so you can't always treat it the same way you would a normal distribution. So each distribution has what's called a standard link function. Common ones are identity, log, and logit. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but essentially what it helps to do is it helps transfer data from the model scale to the actual data scale. And again, I'm just going to hand wave here. I'll, I'll kind of explain what that means pictorially that 
to help us get a, a working feeling for it, you can dig more into the theory and real mathematics of it if you want. So at the base level, identity link is sort of like the normal distribution. There is no difference between the measurement and uh, the model and the data. It's just one to one. However, for something like a log link, it's actually set up something like this where it's actually bounded by zero. So you can't get below zero. This is usually for, useful for transforming uh, data from the model scale back to the data scale. For say, say for example, Poisson, you can't have counts below zero, so it's good to have a bounding of that that's bounded at zero. Another thing, like say the the beta distribution, might benefit, or the log logistic regression might benefit from the logit link, which is actually bounded by zero and one, so you can't have uh, data one or greater or zero or lower. And so this helps generate those uh, predicted prediction curves for your data based on your modeling. And we'll see some examples of this when we when we look at the, the distributions at work. Again, consult references. I'm hand waving on a lot of these things here, I'm trying to focus more on the broad picture. Okay, so let's 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 look a little bit now at what I would call taxonomy, how these different distributions are related to each other or how we can kind of categorize them. So there's a couple different ways. Um, there's actually a lot, a lot of distributions. I'm just picking off some of the most common or, or standard ones. So notes, taxonomy I'll show here will be exhaustive. So first one here, we might look at a taxonomy by the topology of their support. Again, that's beyond what we're going here, but we can see that you can throw out different things. For example, you can have countable variables. I keep talking about count variables, so Poisson, binomial geometric, those are falling into that. Something unbounded, we can see here there's this normal distribution. We, we don't have, the range can be negative infinity to infinity, and you can see that there's other ones like the Kalchi and the Levi, or the Levy. You can see things like transfer forms, like the log normal, it looks like there's other ones, mixtures, non-parametric, half-line, finite, interval, etc. So that's one way to, to, to do it. Another way, uh, this is a nice resource I found, kind of shows the relations between them and a nice little history. And we can see like, here's the normal here. If you, it's related to like the log normal, it's doing T, it's sort of skewed, there's chi squared and things going down the gamma, beta, etc. Bernoulli here is those coin flips, so it's binary one or the other, goes into things like geometric, negative binomial, exponential, Weibull, all the way over to uniform, and then you can have binomial, Poisson, hypergeometric, and they're related. I mean, this isn't exactly tells you which ones to use what, but kind of gives you a, a feel of like, okay, how, how are they a little bit related to each other? in a fast and loose sort of way. Now, though a little more helpful flowchart is this one I found here, where you can follow the questions to come up with a distribution that you might want to use. So at its top, we can see that distinction that we made at the beginning here between continuous and discrete. And then ask other sorts of questions like symmetry, uh, estrine outcomes, and it, we're not going to dig into all this, but you can see it comes up with a lot of the distributions down here, like normal, logistic, which we haven't covered yet, but other ones like log normal exponential that we have, negative binomial, geometric, binomial, and then a couple other ones through here. So something like this is kind of nice as well. And we can see major distinction, of course, is going to be between discrete and continuous. Another one is, at least in the continuous, is symmetry, etc. So we'll leave that off for now. Again, you can dig into this more as you
desire. Now I'll look at a variety of those distributions we've talked about broadly in more detail. So let's start with the normal and the log normal. So a normal distribution models dispersion from a central point. We've already talked about that, the Plinko example. It's continuous, unbounded, and with a variance independent of its mean. So that makes it sort of unique here. Here's some examples. All these pictures will be taken from um, Wikipedia distribution, so you can see that in more detail in the references. But you can see here, this, these are these probability density functions and our different parameters, so our means and our variance. You can see that they'll take different shapes, but in any case, they'll be symmetrical. If you have, say here, uh, mean of zero, the first one we have low variance. We can see it's a pretty sharp peak, so pretty well defined, but as you boost up the variance, we can see it spreads out more and more. It's less and less, the, the mean is sort of less and less clearly defined. Um, there's a lot more variation. Okay, the log normal is pretty simply the distribution whose transformation is normal here. You can see here that it's bounded, so there's there's no, uh, it goes to zero at zero here. And you can see here, it's definitely sort of asymmetric here. Though at certain, certain settings, it, it, it looks a lot like just the normal distribution. Okay, let's look at binary and binomial. So these are gonna be discrete rather continuous. So binary is a distribution that models two outcomes. These are also known as Bernoulli trials. And a great example of this is coin flips here. Again, we have the probability distribution function. It's either gonna be zero or one. So you might have, if it's a fair coin, say, it's gonna be 50-50 before heads and tails. If it's an unfair coin, it might be skewed in one way or the other. Now the binomial, it's a distribution that models the number of successes from Bernoulli trials. So this is sort of the extension of the, the binary distribution. This could be uh, coin flips. So the idea with this is there's a, so many number of trials and then the outcome. So this is for, so you, you're gonna have the probability and the number of trials. So these are coin flips, say for 20 coin flips, coin flips, you can see that's the blue, probably a five. We, the, the most likely probability is uh, like 10 heads. If you have a probability of 720, it's going to shift up because it's going to be, say this would be an unfair coin, it's going to be a higher probability. And again, if you go up to 40 and the probability is 50, it's going to be 10, or sorry, 20 rather than 10 because there's twice as many trials and you see it, it, it broadens out a little bit. Okay, with that. Let's look at geometric Poisson and negative binomial. These three are discrete as well. So geometric is the distribution that models the number of Bernoulli trials needed for one success. So you can, again, I said you can start at zero or one. We typically look at ones that start at one. So the example would be like flip coins and dull heads. We see here, uh, in, any, in any case, it sort of looks sort of like almost like a decay where at the very beginning here, depending on the probability of the event, and it becomes more and more unlikely that it'll take, you know, eight or 10 of these events to get one success. The Poisson is number of counts occurring at a certain rate. So this can be through space or time. So, and they'll typically look like this. And you can see that the, that at higher rates here, it starts to approximate normal distribution, but at very low, so lambda low rates, it has, looks more like say something geometric. So some example might be the number of patrons entering a restaurant in an hour, so that's through time, or the number of trees per acre, what's that through space. Then the negative binomial is a distribution that models the number of failures needed for a certain number of successes. However, I did tell you that there's an alternate way to think of it. You can also th think of it as used for count data, so like a Poisson distribution. But 
for overdispersed data. So sort of an overdispersed correction for the Poisson. So the more conventional example would be flip coins until three heads count the number of tails. But you could also think of the number of patrons entering a restaurant in an hour when it's highly dispersed. You can see here, depending on the number of events and the probability, it'll take different sort of shapes. The probability distribution, dis probability density function will take different shapes. Okay, let's look at the exponential, the gamma, and the beta. And these are all continuous. So that exponential is the distribution that models the inner arrival time between Poisson process events. So this might be something like the time between arrival of patrons into a restaurant. So it's important to note here that while these are talking about Poisson process events, this is talking about the time. So that's continuous where the, the events are discrete. And the example might be time between arrival of patrons into a restaurant. You can see how this definitely looks like a decay, sort of exponential decay function. As, as time increases or whatever sort of variable analogous to time goes up, the probability drops to zero. And the gamma is a distribution that models the total arrival time for a number of Poisson process events. So that looks a little bit different. So it might be the time it takes for five patrons to enter a restaurant. You can see here, there's two different what are called shape parameters and you can see it can have a wide variety of shapes all the way from looking Pretty, pretty similar to exponential to sort of like a skewed normal distribution. If I would beta distribution of the models of proportion of successes between zero and one. So it would be, and an example would be the proportion of hits out of at bats. And as like the gamma, the beta distribution can fit a whole sorts of different settings given the parameters all the way from sort of kind of a normal distribution or at least symmetric to skewed to even like this sort of u shape so it can fit a lot of different things right now we'll just have a brief blazing look at some other distributions that we won't go into details or run examples of but that are important and might be good for you to know of. First is uniform, where it, it's symmetric and we close or open. It's actually really useful for Bayesian statistics, but essentially across the entire range, so, so from A to B, the probability of a value is the same. So there's that. There's the student's T. So this is very similar to a normal distribution. It's symmetric, it's unbounded, and it's used when sample sizes are smaller than and population uh, standard deviation is unknown. So one of the differences between this and the normal distribution is as it has heavier tails, so more more kurtosis, as it were. Then there is Cauchy distribution. The physicists call it the Lorenz. It can be described as a ratio of two independently normal distributed random variables with a mean of zero. So a little bit different interpretation, but you can see it, it's fairly symmetric, looks in some ways like a normal distribution. Then there's a the Laplace, which is pretty interesting because of its peak. It sort of has a sharp peak. It's also known as a double exponential distribution. Essentially, you can think of each of them as this is one exponential function, another one, and they're spliced together back to back. So that is Pretty interesting here. Then there's the hypergeometric. It's like the geometric in, in the fact that it's discrete, but uh, and it's the probability of case successes, but specifically without replacement. So it's a little bit of a modification. There is the Weibel, which classically was used to describe particle distribution. You can see here that it can take on a lot of different forms depending on the parameters lambda and k. There's the chi-squared, which is used as uh, actually a special case of the gamma, and it's uh, k independent standard normal random variables. This is used a lot in inferential statistics. Then for uh, final, there's uh, the Prado distribution, which is also known as the power law probability distribution. It 
is used a lot in economics, business. Uh, it's where that 80-20 rule comes from, where essentially like 80% of work or productivity is done by like 20% of the people, etc. So it's kind of an interesting, more more economic or social science side of it, but it can be used in a lot of other fields too. Okay, now we're going to get our hands busy coding with some SAS examples. SAS has built in a lot of different distributions you can use, most of the ones we've already looked at here, and then some, some that we don't. So you see a beta, binary, Gaussian. Some things we won't use is like multinomial or inverse Gaussian, but they're there. And so I have a sheet here. I'll turn over to that now to take a look at that. Here we are in SAS Studio. The first thing we'll do here to run some examples of statistical distributions is create and view our own distributions. We're doing a data RAND statement, and so we're going to run 10,000 samples or random values for 10,000 observations for a bunch of different distributions. For all this, just how it goes is there's a RAND function from a normal distribution, say for normal, a random leave from a normal distribution and then of the parameters so for these this is the the mean and standard deviation etc some of them like say poisson there's just one parameter that's the lambda so all of these just have uh, different parameter values and then we're going to print those so we run that okay so this is just the head of it we can see that there's all sorts of values ranging from continuous to my normal to count from like say my Poisson to even binary variables for like our binary distribution. Okay, then we're gonna run proc univariate for all of these so we can get nice histograms. So we can kind of see how they, it looks like in action. Okay, we're, we're gonna skip the summary statistics, not, not strictly needed here. So normal distribution, nice and symmetric, around, around I think 80. Log normal, pretty close because of our high, um, some of our parameters, variables. If we we're closer to zero, it might be a little more skewed. But we can see here is a little little skewed on on the right here. My beta, you can see here, much different from a normal distribution. You can see that they're different here. Binary, of course, this is there. Zero or one. Binomial looks a little bit like the normal distribution, but this is discrete, so it's a little more choppier. Exponential, sort of decay, sort of curve. Gamma, you see it more of a like a skewed. And and these will of course change if you you mess around with the parameters like ge geometric. Uh, negative binomial and Poisson. There we go. So of course we can change around the parameters if you'd like. You could put the, the zero and this to one, however you want. Then let's look at some distributions in action. So I'm just going to get a couple data sets here. This is from the SAS help. So fish and baseball. So the fish are just a variety of weight, sort of measurements on different types of fish and then a bunch of stats for baseball players. So the normal, we're going to just look at a, a histogram for just bream and then run a, a regression model length as a function of height and then just a, a Gaussian distribution, so a normal distribution, see how that works out. So, and we can actually fit go back here for a univariate we can fit a normal distribution density function onto it that's what it looks here so it looks normal enough so it kind of justifies running a this with a normal distribution it seems that height was significant in predicting our weight or sorry our length and that it had a fairly good fit we're not going to go into fits this is too much but 
I think, good enough. However, if we wanted to do something with log normal, say we took a look at our weight instead, you can see here that uh, weight is a little not quite as normally distributed, and I threw a normal and a log normal. Both kind of yeah, are, are all right. But then what we can do here, first I'm going to actually do this thing here where I, I make a transformation into log weight. And we're going to take a look at what that looks like. Log transformed. Oops. Don't mind me. Just got to get all the data. And that, that fits closer to a normal distribution when you log transform. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to both look at a normal dis using a normal distribution with our transform variable and then a log normal distribution with our non-transform variable. And as you will see here, so first of all, it was significant, but we see the F value is 3, 305 over here is the exact same. So either these are the, the exact same procedure, whether a transform form variable normally or a normal variable with a log normal transformation. So that's what's going on there. So let's look at exponential and gamma. We're going to look at salary and we're going to uh, plot a histogram and take a look and see here salary really doesn't fit a normal distribution in this blue very well but something like a gamma or exponential seems to fit that a little better that more of that sort of decays so we're going to try both an exponential and a gamma and what we find so our looking at salary and then Looks like the number of, these are career home runs. That was significant for the, our first one here, our exponential. And then we're just gonna look at AICC. So that's 3,059, or 3,759. We go to gamma, it's also significant. And the 5,000 is a little bit smaller, so 3,600. So it looks like in the end, both, both are significant, but looks like this gamma might be a better, slightly better fit. So we would probably go with that. But you can see as an example of using different distributions that both fit the data to varying degrees. So now let's look at beta. We're gonna create a new variable called um, percentage of hits. And we'll look at that with both a normal and a beta distribution. We go down and it looks like, regardless this proportion looks fits a normal or a beta pretty well, almost indistinguishably. So we're going to run both a glimmix, of a, uh, a glimmix that's a generalized linear mix model, if they're a Gaussian, so a normal and a, and a beta, Let's see how we get out. So it looks like division, so that's both either east or west or American or national, did not simply predict our y variable, which was the proportion of hits. That was, it was just not significant for the normal. And then if we look at the beta, it's also not significant, but they're essentially the same. But we, can, we could definitely see situations where a beta fit would be much better than a normal. And finally, we'll do, uh, not finally, next we'll do binary. We'll model league, what the probability of being a league, so American or national, See if that's predicted by the years in the major, and that was not significant. There was no significant difference. So binomial, now what we're going to do is create a new data it's called number of total. So we're going to have the number of total hits as the sum of number of whole runs and runs. And then we're going to model that essentially as this binomial. So home runs over total binomial. You can see this looks pretty similar. Oh, I need to run this. Looks a little similar to the beta, but this is more on the, the, the discrete count variable. We can see here that, yeah, it looks like that was significant and we had some residuals. 
but what we can take home from this was that the number of home runs was significantly different across division. Or sorry, the number of home runs over total runs, sort of the proportion, the discrete proportion. Geometric, we'll, we'll look at the number of home runs. I think this is this is gonna be, might fit a, yeah, geometric, all right. And yeah, that was significant. So salary did predict the number of home runs, unsurprisingly, higher salaries. Pe players tended to have more home runs. We'll do the same sort of things with both Poisson and negative binomial. See if we can get anything better here. See here that, yep, the, I mean, same sort of thing. Number of home runs was significantly by salary. If we look at the fit, um, now we're gonna look at chi-squared degrees of freedom. So this looks like it's a little over dispersed. It should be about two or lower. If we go to the negative binomial, we see that dispersion was taken care of. And so it's a little bit of a better fit. It's so, so significant. Okay, with that, that wraps up our SAS portion. Now that we've finished up with SAS, let's take some time to let R give us examples. Now R in some of the packages can certainly do far more distributions, but for our purposes here, we'll restrict ourselves to some of the more default ones. So we won't go into everything, but we will cover things like Bonomo, Gaussian, Gamia, Poisson. And again, we'll look at that here. Here we are in our studio. We're as like we did for SAS. We will create and view distributions. Again, we're just going to call them my, normal, my log, normal, etc. And we take them from these random, where you take the, the number, so 10,000, and then our different parameter estimates. And then I'm just going to run those and then get histograms. And we'll kind of go backwards with Poisson. I have the same parameter estimates, so they should look very similar to the ones in SAS, albeit maybe a little bit different auto binning. Take a binomial, geometric, gamma, exponential, binomial, binary, beta, log normal, and normal. And again, you can, of course, change around the parameters. So now let's look at some distributions in action. I'm going to load our stats2 data library and our ggplot2 library. Stats2 uh, that has a little bunch of example data sets and then ggplot2 is for plotting. So let's look at a normal distribution from data apple stock. Let's see, this is just a uh, change in, I, I want to actually get like a true normal distribution. So it's a change. We're going to look at the change in stock price um, as a function of uh, volume. We can see here that uh, change can actually be negative, which a lot of variables can't be. So don't technically fit a normal distribution, just approximate one. So this one seems to be a nice fit for a true normal distribution. So we're going to create a linear model, change as a function of volume, and this will be Gaussian, so normal. And what we do is we find volume was a significant predictor. So let's plot this. So we're using ggplot2, and we're going to pop this up here. Um, there we go. We can see here that this might not be the best fit. We can see there might be some other violations of the normality that are, are violated, but we'll wave that away for a moment. What we can see here as volume goes up, so does uh, change. But we can see that this, this black line is, supposed to, is zero, so you can see that it can fall above and below zero. So there we go here. If I was to do this for reals, or an actual analysis, I'd probably look at more sophisticated models, but we'll leave that for now. So now, binary, we're gonna look at the data walk the dogs, which is going to look at whether or not the author of this package or this data set walked their dogs. So there's either a zero they didn't or one they did. So if we can predict it through the number of calories they burned a day. So we can look at 
that. It looks like that was significant, so we're going to plot that. What that's going to look like is this. And you can see that that logit sort of distribution is bounded by 0 and 1. So what this is telling us is as the number of kilocalories goes up, the probability of them go, taking the dogs for it goes up. You can see here, for example, this outlier here, that this burned the most, and that was when they almost certainly walk the dogs. Whereas uh, if they have very low kilocalories, it's unlikely that they, they walk the dogs. So the probability of walking the dogs on the Y, the X is calories. Now we'll do binomial. We'll look at, uh, these are I think football data for like kickers. So let's look at this. And so this is uh, distribution number. So there's a number and then the number of uh, like kicks made, I think, uh, field goal distance make, proportion made, blocked, etc. So we're gonna see if the distance can predict the number of them made over attempts. And that looks significant, unsurprisingly. And so what we'll do is we'll plot here. And again, we have that logistic, that uh, that logit sort of transformation. We see it's bounded by zero and one. It's as the distance to the field goal increases, the probability the or the proportion of those made decreases. So if it's really high, it, Almost none of those kicks make it, but if it's very close, almost all of them do. So those are some examples here. Now let's look at a gamma distribution for horse prices. So we got horses. There we go. Horse price, we're going to see if uh, price can be predicted by height with a gamma distribution. We'll summary it. Looks like that is significant. And typically chose significant interactions so we could have nice plots, but you of course can do this with non-significant. And we can see here, yeah, as height increases, the price tend to increase. You can see here that this is not a, this isn't like a normal distribution where it'd be a straight line. This has a curved line. It's bounded by zero, so this line can't go below zero, but it can go as high as it needs to. Poisson, class of sort count data. We have glowworm eggs. The number of eggs, so there's that. And we're going to see if the number of eggs is going to be predicted by, I think, the lantern. That's like the, the actual bug that lays it, like lanternfly or something like that. Anyways, the, their length, and that was significant. And so what we can look at here is the plot. And yeah, as length goes up, so does the number of eggs. And again, this is for that log transformation. That log link where it's bounded by zero but can go as high as it needs to. And then um, here are just some references uh, if you need them. And that wraps up our, our examples. Okay, we have finished our whirlwind tour of the distributions. We've gone up, we've gone down. We've explored the wide world of distributions. And hopefully, through this talk, you got a better appreciation for how data came to be, how we can model it using statistical distributions, and how we can get advanced insights beyond, say, the classical statistical test assuming normal distributions. So very helpful on our end if you would take a post-test and survey found at the links here or in the description below. Okay, here are our references for all the images. Some of the images, of course, were useful, some were just fun, but you can find them here, as well as materials, including sort of general information distributions, more specific examples, and these last three here are really dig into uh, distributions of probability density functions, more details there. And then, as always, the code is supported by the NIH, so please cite reference, acknowledge, whatever you want to say it, the Dakota in any of your publications that found these or other training tools useful. Thank you and have a well-distributed day.